All right, hi everybody, welcome to the first um, round table. What? Okay. Uh, called, let's have recommendations. <laughs> um, yeah, so of course we have uh, Kate Murray from the LOC, Andy Irving, who you've just heard talking about, Triple from the British Library, and Eve Niederhauser from Memoriav. So um, we have 45 minutes. I have a bunch of questions, but I hope you have a bunch of questions too. So don't be shy. So um, all of our panelists have engaged in organizing, funding, and maintaining projects that produce a uh, recommendation for audiovisual preservation. So these recommendations are there to provide guidance and advice to the community, um, to the communities they serve, um, and are most often created collaboratively, collaboratively and through consensus, something that actually just addressed for AAAF. So let's just start off with if Kate, um, if y'all could just talk about a little bit of your projects. Uh, sh sure, is this on? Um, so um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I organized the FAGI group and um, FAGI is led by the Library of Congress, but it is a collaborative and cooperative group uh, and all of our funding comes from the Library of Congress. With the one exception, we had one project to build AVI meta edit, and that came from the National Archives when I was working at the National U.S. National Archives at the time. Um, so uh, I, I would say uh, FAGI is um, for federal agencies, by federal agencies. So participation in FAGI uh, as an active member of FAGI is limited uh, to employees of US federal agencies. And that's just kind of a scoping thing because it makes it a little bit easier. But uh, it also helps us uh, to get funding if we're making projects and tools, um, et cetera, for federal agencies. But we are always open. And I think we're becoming more transparent and more open, uh, especially um, in, in our newest project, which I'll just completely go off script and talk about that for a second, which, um, so we are uh, developing, or we're testing uh, FFV1 and Matroska for use in federal agencies, which is a huge step for the US federal agencies. Um, a lot of our FAGI participants, especially in the Smithsonian, um, but also uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture and, and many other places are interested in using FFV1 and Matroska, um, but, they're, they're looking for sort of a seal of approval from FAGI, uh, and we are happy to, to take a look at it. FAGI never says use this format and not that format, but um, one of the things, some of the things that will come out of our testing project, which is happening right now, is uh, a formal testing protocol for FFV1 and Matroska, as well as a set of graded sample files so that other folks can use those files to do their own testing in their own institutions. So um, we hope to have that completed January-ish, I don't really know. Um, so, um, what else should I say? Well, I mean. Um, ha, ha, money, let's talk about money. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but maybe let's just have also an introduction to um, Eve's work on Memoria Fair. They do tell you what not to do. Sorry? They're in, um, sometimes in the recommendations, you do tell us yeah. what not to do. Maybe. But maybe just speak broadly about yeah, the latest recommendations. Yeah, thanks. Maybe just first, because I think most of you do not really know Memory of. Memory of is a Swiss association that supports the preservation and access of Swiss audiovisual heritage. And to do so, we organize a network of stakeholders and experts uh, around our place. And uh, we are consulting memory institutions. We are co-funding projects. We are also organizing lots of events and conferences, stuff like this, uh, like today. And we also have uh, uh, some publications we do. And one of our publication genre, if you want, so is uh, recommendations. As our whole organization is divided into four divisions, uh, media-related divisions, photo, film, sound, and video. Um, in the last years, we published um, for each of these uh, um, divisions we published recommendations. So I have some of these here. Some of them are expired, but I leave it to, to them if you are interested. So this is video in French and German. We always do things at least in French and German, some things in Italian and or English. For sound, the same. I only have the German ones. 
for photo, it's quite recent. And the new ones I talk today about, I think, is, is this, you may know, these uh, recommendations on digital archive of film of video. We, we, as the whole life cycle of, of audiovisual heritage, of course, since quite a time now, is completely digital, um, this division into media-related uh, recommendations makes less and less sense. And this was the first recommendation we did for film and video, so cross-division recommendation, and I think we should go further with this and, and integrate all the, the, the media types in, in one recommendation because most of the maybe not technical recommendations are just cross-media uh, type uh, mm -hmm. recommendations. Right, so, so I think that leads well into what Andy was talking about earlier, but something else you'd like to share about your work at AAAF? Yeah, well I think specifically around recommendations. So when writing a, or working on a collaborative specification, um, you're describing everything that could be done, right? Whereas recommendations are how you would do these specific things. Uh, and so the disconnect between those two has been quite difficult. So it's easier for somebody who has been involved in working on those specifications to say, that is how I would do that, versus somebody who's coming in uh, from the outside and is perhaps not as familiar. So one of the things that we've focused on in this kind of last year or so uh, in the IIIF community is working on a, a cookbook uh, of specific examples. So from I'd like to display a simple video to I'd like to uh, do an opera performance that's got uh, you know eight different angles and some of them run concurrently and how do we how could you possibly build that together? Well, we've started working on this cookbook that's got live examples and and, and so on. Okay. Um, your presentation talked about finances and Kate, you were addressing how do you fund such projects? Like, what are, what is the catalyst? Why certain projects over others? Like, what is the catalyst? What's the prioritization? Sure. Um, I'll just echo first what, what these guys sure. were saying. It's, it's so hard about um, when you're working on these sort of collaborative practices to keep them up, up to date. So FAGI has a uh, SOW statement of work for digitizing motion picture film that we put out probably three or four years ago. And I've been getting a lot of questions about it and it desperately needs to be updated and it's really a challenge to sort of keep those kinds of things going because it's the same group of people that do all this work, we just wear different hats. So it, it, in my mind, there is no, uh, it, it's really challenging to sort of keep keep that train going. But when we talk about funding, I made a joke in my talk about just two short years later, right, we got funding for BWF MetaEdit, which has been out for eight years or something, which is a long time for an open source tool to be out there. And it is a great mystery to me how anything gets funded at the Library of Congress, even though I'm the one who puts that funding request in, because uh, it, I would say it's, it's uh, persistence, you know, what gets through and what doesn't get through. It's, it's all about sort of the scoping of the project and, um, you know, who is uh, making the case for uh, the community to use it. And FAGI is uh, very uh, engaged and supportive of open source tools. Um, and we, the fact that it has been downloaded, I don't know, something like, I don't have the stats in my head, but like 40,000 times, that's a lot, right? For, for an open source tool, for a format that's, um, you know, been around a long time. Um, so we are um, fortunate to be at the Library of Congress and to work for FAGI, who is supportive of this. So I'm, I was astounded to get funding for BWF MetaEdit you know, sort of the reboot of that, because we have not been funding it for the last, I don't know, I'm gonna say four or five years, so, you know, some significant amount of time. Jerome's been working on that out of the goodness of his own heart um, until I made the, the library feel guilty about that and said, like, we need to step up if our name is on this. Um, and for some of the other projects that we fund, we have the new tool um, Embark, which uh, is to uh, in, embed metadata and to do some conformance testing right now just for DPX, but for, for other things. And, and a lot of the drivers for the work of FAGI is because A, the Library of Congress uses that format, even though DPX is certainly a legacy format, but there's a gajillion of them out there, but then also other FAGI members um, have it. So if we're able to uh, uh, describe the need and to um, have really the defined user base and say this is the folks that it help I, and I can consistently nag people uh, to make the case um, then uh, funding is I'm not gonna say I'm gonna get it but um, I can 
and y'all could put this on Twitter, right? That I can be an incredible nag if I need to, right? And to get that money. Um, and, and so that's how that all works. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so the British Library applied for a grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation to help uh, lead the uh, AAA FAV work, um, which was, uh, wouldn't really recommend, because uh, we probably spent more time writing the proposal uh, than the duration of the, uh, of the grant. Um, but there's definitely, there's definitely funding out there um, in this space. Yeah, we remember if it's in some ways quite easy because we have uh, government funds uh, that we mainly use to f co fund projects. So the most of the money we receive, we go give it um, back or uh, away for, for institutions in the heritage sector. Um, but we are tied to a performance agreement and among a lot of other things, there is the developing and maintaining and publishing of, of recommendations for it. So it's quite simple. We have just this agreement, and as long as it stands, we do publish recommendations. Right. So you get your funding, you write up your recommendations, but the first thing that you say in your recommendations is, this has an expiration date. So how long do you wait to go back to your funding? And they're like, oh, we need more funding, because now these are not out. May I? outdated or they need to be updated? Like, how do you navigate those spaces? Yes, there are different layers of answers now. <laughs> One is that in the agreement, we have the, the uh, uh, yearly review is fixed in it. So we have to look at it at least once in a year. But of course, most of, of the recommendations you just need to, to review, review it all the time. And as I said, we all do, we are tiny uh, organizations compared to the ones uh, you represent. And we, all of the people who work on these recommendations do this among a lot of other things. So this is this layer of, of the answer as well. So we can just not always review it and work on it. We do what we can. And what we can do is, is uh, try to, to meet so um, three, four times a year, and, and then uh, check uh, what parts of the recommendations ju really just need uh, 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 work, and then we, we engage in the workflows we, we set up. So do you see any risks regarding these expiration dates? Like by the time people are starting to look into it, understanding it, and starting to implement, then they're already obsolete or outdated. Can any of you speak to that? Well, there's different rates of change in, say, uh, preservation file format standards versus, uh, you know, how quickly web browsers change, right? So the the time that you need to dedicate to to these things is is, is vastly different. So most uh, well, I'll let Kate. <laughs> I was, was going to say something that I really liked it better if you said it. Well, now what were we going to say, and then I'll say something. No, that, that's that's cheap. <laughs> yeah. There's two mics as well. Like you can just. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, certainly there's different rates of change. Um, and, and I would say once something is written down, it, it becomes really hard to change that. And we've certainly experienced that with some fadgy stuff that has been around for a long time, and people will come back and question me about it a couple of years later. And I think there's been a lot of chatter now in, uh, about scanning motion picture film and, um, like, technical... Um, uh, transfer characteristics in film and sort of uh, uh, and some of the expanded color ranges that they're looking at now in DPX for you know HDR and stuff and we just haven't had the time to go and do that. Um, Fadgy is one of many things that I do and I, I actually don't spend most of my time doing Fadgy work although um, I, I would love to do so. Uh, I'll give a shout out to um, Yasa and TCO6 which is published for the first time I think uh, digital first and um, in an incremental fashion because these things especially with um, with digital video these things are going to change and so it's a lot easier to make those changes when it's not sort of formalized, um, you know, in like a written book or something, in a published book. Um, I'm still wondering what Andy thinks I'm going to say. So um, <laughs> and I'm hopeful that he's going to give me a hint there. Uh, but I, I would say, yeah, with, with all of the recommendations um, that, that sort of go out, you really have to take everything with a grain of salt because it's all about your content, or your context rather, in, in your community and what you can do and how much money you have and what your systems are. You know, if you are a, um, an institution that uses a lot of um, open source tools or if you're using some proprietary stuff, um, 
you know, it, it really depends on, on, on what, you, what your content is, what your surroundings are, and, you know, what you're able to do, and that will hopefully help you realize, you know, what recommendations can you follow or not. I'm a big fan in good enough, right, that, that you don't have to reach the pinnacle of, of whatever the recommendations are. You do what you can do in your own institution, and, um, you know, you do the best with what you have. I think... Now, now I'll pass it to Andy. Oh, no, okay. That, that was it, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay I, I think um, maybe we are not uh, talking all about the same because this, the more specific your recommendations are, the more you have this risk of expiration date. I think um, what we try to do in our um, recommendations as they are targeted to people who are not specialists in the mm -hmm. field, we are trying to be quite general. And we, we try to... So you have um, these high... Uh, level recommendations who just don't expire that fast. This, I, I talk about principles, methods, terminology, and, and uh, just guidance for how you should think about this, uh, the stuff you do or the stuff you have to preserve. So this will not expire that fast, so the principles stay. But the more you get uh, into details and the more practical your recommendations are, of course, then there you have all this very fast uh, development cycle of technical uh, 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 things that, that will make your recommendations expire very fast. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to open to the floor if anybody has a question or comment. We've got some questions from oh. uh, outside of the room. Um, this is for from Erwin uh, to... Well, sorry, one sec. Have you considered opening these recommendations or documents up for public comments or versioning, for example, a Git style format? Start with IIIF. Uh, so all the IIIF uh, documents are published in draft form uh, and fully versioned. Uh, and then there's a kind of a process through GitHub of commenting on and extending and changing. Uh, and then those are reflected in, in the change log. Uh, and exactly the same for the, the cookbook recipes. So from that point of view, yes, absolutely. Uh, because I think we all recognize that not all of us know everything about everything we're looking at, and especially very complex technical detail-oriented things. There's so much stuff to miss that uh, you know, we all appreciate somebody else going, you've, you've made a mistake. Uh, sure, Fadji uh, is always happy to take comments. So um, because uh, the Fadji group is limited to um, just federal agency participation, we do have an open comment period after we publish something as a draft in which anyone is welcome to comment um, on that. But um, uh, And then we're happy to take comments at any time. I will say it, we're trying to make the FFB1 MKV exploration a little bit more open, and I, I should probably... Uh, I think it's on me that I haven't made it as open as it should be, um, because I, we don't have a lot of experience with FFV1 in the federal agency community. Um, there, there are some folks that are super um, into it, like uh, especially Blake and um, and Namak, but uh, we don't have a, a lot of wide uh, experience. So uh, we're trying to make that more open so that we could have a little bit more participation. But I, I would say we're always happy to take comments and hear feedback. It, it's just making the actual change to the document that slows me down. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same for us. So we, are, we really um, welcome any feedbacks on, on all of our recommendations. But as document, even if they are web published documents, they are quite erratic. So there is a long way from the document or, or from a comment or uh, feedback to something that <laughs> you will find in this. And we are actually, we are, Right now, we are working on a new concept for the developing and, and uh, editing of recommendations and a new form for the publi uh, publication. And one of the requirements is exactly this, that we find ways that people can annotate or tag or, or comment or whatever with the document itself. But it's not here yet. This is just what we try to work on. OK, I think, I think there's another question. Or, yep, Dave. No. Yeah. David Pfluger, I'm part of the uh, team behind the memory of recommendations. Well, if 
partly already said what I was going to um, comment, that w we are constantly working on it and updating it. For us, it's, it's just a question, when is the time to go public mm -hmm. again? Yeah. So when we are working uh, in the form of a PDF file, print is definitely out of date. <coughs> um, then we need to assemble enough changes to say, okay, now it's going through the pipeline of uh, the whole graphic design, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to finish it, to to put it out publicly. So, and that that line is not uh, to be underestimated uh, concerning the time it takes. And that's also why we kind of decided to uh, try to change the whole uh, workflow and the, uh, the way of publication, so this could be uh, become shorter. Yeah, I was wondering when, I, when we were putting together these questions, like when do you know that you're ready? Like yeah. is there like a, a tingling feeling inside of you that's like, I'm done? No, I think as David says, we are really caught in, uh, in kind of a rat race because the way is that long mm -hmm. uh, from the first ideas to, to, to working on it and, and to the publication. This way is that long that you just try to publish something that is not expired yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's one question. I have a fundamental question. Uh, have you tried to use in the, um, because we hear um, many things for the um, uh, saving, but we haven't uh, heard too much for the um, first, uh, practically second step restoration. Have you tried to use, and if you uh, use what open, uh, open uh, soft uh, for the, um, restoration stage of the, um, you know, the preservation is scanning, uh, digitizing or scanning, restoration and uh, saving or, uh, you know, um, long-term uh, preservation. Uh, so the second step, restoration, uh, have you tried, have you used it, do you know the open uh, soft uh, things? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you talking about digital storage, or are you? Is there? Can can you try again? Well, um, <clears throat> the overall pro process is uh, digitization of the original, restoration, second step, and first step is uh, long-term storage. Okay. And I asking about the second step, restoration. Have you tried to use some? Uh, open source or some public uh, tools for the, this uh, stage of the... Oh, okay. So I myself, um, d we uh, don't do, uh, have experience with sort of restoration software. I don't know, does anyone else on this Any, panel? No, I don't. Probably not. Probably not. But we can probably put you in touch with other folks that do. There may be some presentations mm -hmm. later. Otherwise, I can put you in touch with uh, someone at the Library of Congress wh whom you can contact and they can talk about that. Just one remark, what we try to do in, in, in these recommendations is, is give a kind of a toolbox and uh, we are really fighting with this thing. It has not the form we like to, uh, it to have, but we are assembling tools. So if you know tools, even if I don't know them, I gather them and we try to do something that is useful for others. If, if you uh, think of certain tools, uh, the question is. Any, okay, yeah. Who? Oh, Lars. Hi, I'm Lars Goester. Uh, I I'll want to go back to comments because uh, you, you ask for comments, but do you get comments? Because the experience with TC06, which we put out as a draft one and a half year ago, uh, we never got much comments on it, which may be a good thing. But 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 uh, then again, uh, I feel it's it's a it's a loss. I would say it depends on how bad your first draft is. If you get a lot of comments, um, so which which it, which, which um, the Fagi uh, Significant Properties Project, it it's super drafty and there's lots of to comes to comes and. Uh, I made the conscious decision just to put it out as it was and hope to solicit comments, and we have gotten comments, and we certainly do get comments about Fadgie stuff that comes out, um, you know, even two or three years later, if someone will contact us if there's been a change and we make um, an adjustment to that. TCO6 was, you know, organized by Carl Fleischauer, and 
which is probably why you're not getting any comments because he's telling you everything you need to know now. Um, but I think that folks would really welcome that. But um, I would say whenever someone does send a comment, we're so appreciative and we respond immediately. And um, you know, we we sort of have discussion and make the adjudication, you know, if it's appropriate to update or not. Um, the, in my other hat at the Library of Congress is that I run the Sustainability of Digital Formats website, which is a fantastic resource if you haven't um, taken a look at that. And um, we go into in-depth detail of you know over almost 500 formats now, and um, uh, and we analyze them from a preservation perspective about you know what are the um, sustainability factors and you know the structure of the format and what have you. And I'm, I'm amazed. And, and that website gets about 50,000 unique visitors a month, and I get four or five, six comments a week people asking me super technical questions about these formats, which we go back and, 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 and answer. So I, I would say if you ask for comments, they will come in at some point, um, you, uh, and then you just sort of have to decide what to do about them. But we're always grateful to get them. Yeah, I mean, there's also different types of comments, right? So there, I'm lucky enough to work in a community that's extremely uh, engaged, and so we'll get constant uh, feedback uh, through every change or suggestion and long discussion. But then there's also uh, people who make really helpful comments, but that's the only comment they'll ever make, right? It's a kind of a drive-by commenting. Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is that reacting to that comment, it's difficult to go back and make sure that we've resolved whatever the issue was, you know. Um, that's that, that's definitely an issue. Growing the community, I think, is the mm -hmm. only sensible suggestion, so that we've all got so many comments. Yeah, I think we make more or less the same experience as you do with the other. So we we do have comments, but uh, not hundreds of them. This is one reason why we try to find a better form to incite people to to comment and to really interact. But I think, as you said, if you have a, a bad uh, draft or if you have an erratic uh, document, it's just not the same. So the form matters, I think, and the community, of course. Yes, I think if I'm thinking about oh, what um, Samaya, what you were presenting earlier, about finding the right space, the right tools to work collaboratively, to work with other community members that are not in Europe or in North America or in other countries where not all the tools are accessible. So I think it's really important to open up that space and create a welcoming space and encouraging that. So, and yeah, and be patient that like, if people are not used to participating in that way, then, you know, give them time, they'll come. Right, so to lower the bar yeah, for comments and participation. Good. I mean, sometimes uh, I think that we have like, I don't know, a web form or something on our, on our FADU website. But, uh, you know, if, if we were accessible in other ways, then I think we may get some other comments. But I do think it's important to sort of take away that mystery about, you know, how you comment and then reply when you do get them so that people know that you welcome them. And, and yep, um, David? Um, just a reminder to please stand. It is for the web broadcast. Uh, maybe another comment. Uh, as, as we are publishing a, a document which is also geared towards beginners, I believe there's a relatively big group of readers who are actually too timid to, com uh, to comment or or um, get back to us because they believe they're not up to the game to actually comment on what we are doing. But uh, I think people should be less afraid to ask stupid questions or, or make comments on our documents because uh, these, um, just these comments may be very helpful to us, for us to, to figure out what the actual questions are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, well, something I was wondering about is, um, because we've had this experience at the CNA at my institution, is like, when you have recommendations and uh, write recommendations, do you have sometimes a feeling that you're setting up people to fail in one way or another because they're looking at you and you're either big or like you're bigger institutions than other institutions or you have more power or leverage or something like, do you sometimes get the gnawing feeling that you may be setting people up to fail who don't have the same human resources, manpower, budgets? I don't know. 
So it's not a linear curve from beginner to, to expert, right? There is this enormous ramp up between uh, beginner and intermediate, and then this huge gap from to expert. And we, well, speaking in very general terms, all of our communities, I think, focus very heavily on the beginner side and very heavily on the expert side. And there's this enormous gap in the middle uh, for people of, uh, I'm saying intermediate as though it's, it's not, I mean that in a derogatory way, but somebody who, has more than the beginner's experience, but not as much as the uh, the experts. And I think I don't know what the correct answer is for how we target those people and get them uh, better serve those in our communities because there's probably there's we're going to run out of beginners eventually. So I think we'll need to kind of change how we approach those. Um, so the, even within the U.S. federal agencies, there is an enormous um, range of uh, expertise. So uh, you know, we'll have some of the larger agencies, like the Library of Congress and the U.S. National Archives, uh, who who have uh, great, uh, they, uh, lots of resources available to them. But then you'll have other agencies that really do not. So um, there's a project that we did that uh, was looking at. Um, uh, recommendations for testing audio uh, analog to digital converters, right? And uh, we put out uh, two sets of recommendations, one for really high-level folks that could afford to use a $25,000 piece of equipment. And then what we realized is that only the Library of Congress, not even the National Archives, but only the Library of Congress has that $25,000 piece of equipment. And there's a, a, a whole lot of folks that are interested in doing testing but can't afford to do that. So we put out um, another level of recommendations um, that thought, you, know, you may not be able to test all of the different criteria, but you can do some, and some is better than none, right? So we wanted to accommodate that level. Um, and then we also built an open source tool to help them accomplish doing those testing goals, and it's called ADC Test, and um, it's available right now on GitHub. And um, we are now about to do some augmentation of that to include it, to make it even more sort of self-contained, which will include a signal generator. So we are conscious that that um, there is a wide range of, of um, resources and capabilities and all those kinds of things. And we want everyone to find success at the level at which they are. And uh, we hope to be able to meet folks at where they are in, in their various stages. And um, I, I do think it's, uh, which is why Fadgy never says, do this and not that, right? Even in the sustainability of digital formats website, we never say, use this format and not this format format. We, we may hint at some issues in some formats that you should be able to think about you know, among yourselves, but, um, but I, I think that there's sort of, um, you know, uh, there, there is no one way to do it, and we hope that the, whatever way that you choose to do it, that you're informed about the decisions that you're making and feel good about, you know, what you're doing going forward and also be able to make adjustments as you need to going down. Thank you. We, we, we try to target um, more or less the whole range of all these uh, groups. Um, but what we also try to do is to, to help institutions or staff to become aware of the capacities they have. So, uh, and I'm not just talking about infrastructure, uh, money, uh, I'm also talking about know-how. So there is one, um, I th would say, of the topics of, of these recommendations where we treat, uh, should I do things in-house or should I outsource them? So this is one thing, just to, uh, to help institutions um, in this question. And what we introduced, we, we had this in previous versions, but we, we, we laid a more, um, uh, uh, we introduced more on, on this topic of minimal requirement know-how or, or formal uh, education or whatever. Uh, it's a difficult thing to do, but we really think that if an institution decides to really treat digital audiovisual heritage, they just need some know-how and expertise in-house because even if they outsource all they do, they have to check the del uh, deliverables. They have to take the responsibility for the stuff. You cannot outsource responsibility. So this is what we try to do now to, to help all these intermediates maybe to have more know-how uh, after having read these <laughs> recommendations. Yeah. Wait for the mic. Also, fundament also fundamental question. Uh, there is a many bodies right now that try to 
implement standards or recommendation like uh, CMT, EBU, much more, FKTG, CST, ITU, whatever. Uh, how you position both of our guests, how you position uh, your efforts to standardize or to make some recommendation in this big ecosystem of standards, uh, where some of them as as I'm observed, a little bit controversial. You know, some standards just not meet each other, so controversial. So, where your institution or your uh, efforts is positioned in that complicated ecosystem of peoples and institutions that try to uh, impose standards for something? Thank you. So, there's Oh, always a discussion about the, the capital S standards uh, organizations, and that's SIMPTI, and that's EBU, and you know what have you. Um, and the, the work that we do in FAGI, um, we're not a standards body. Uh, we produce recommendations, um, and so we never say something is required. We say strongly suggested. Um, I actually am a member of the SIMPTI standards community, and we sort of uh, infiltrate from within, right, <laughs> to try to open up some of these um, uh, uh, standards organizations. I also sit on the ISO uh, groups for PDF and uh, EPUB and some other things. So uh, I'm very uh, well aware of how all these standards organizations work. I, I would say there is definitely change in, in those organizations. I mean, we published our MXF specification with the Creative Commons license, and that was the first time that was ever done by SIMPTI. And I'll tell you the backstory on that, is that I just put it on there and no one told me I couldn't, and they published it. Um, but there is a little bit more to that, in that, um, that uh, the, the work that, that used to be known as AS07, which is eventually published as um, RDD, which is Registered Disclosure Document 48, um, was previously published with the Creative Commons license, so it had to retain that even when it went out to SIMPTI. Um, the other issue was that the work that, um, that RDD 48 was done by a U.S. federal agency, which none of our publications can co carry any copyright, right? So no nothing ever has copyright. And so SIMPTI could not claim copyright on that either. Um, but I have gotten notice from SIMPTI recently about other folks who are interested, or actually I haven't gotten notice from SIMPTI, I've gotten notice from other folks that are interested in publishing through SIMPTI with a Creative Commons license and how does that work. And, and I think SIMPTI is uh, very interested in um, you know, opening that up a little bit, that the whole process for that. Um, and, and any sort of standards work that goes through a standards, uh, an official standards body like SIMPTI or EBU or ISO, um, there is no speed but slow in those organizations, right? Because it, there is a lot of process around it. And that, that's, not a, that's not to say that it's bad, but there's a lot of process around it. There's a lot of people involved, um, and these things take a long time. Uh, and so any kind of change is always going to be I incremental. When we did our work with the DPX standard in which we compared a lot of um, DPX files and we realized that there was some contradictions in the SIMPTI standard itself uh, and uh, you know, we fed that information back to SIMPTI and it, it's difficult to make for them to make those changes in those documents for a whole variety of reasons. So um, I, I would say to summarize it is like, yes, yeah, standards you know, making and change, like publishing a standard and then making a change to an actual standards document. Um, I don't know that it's any different than a FAGI document or a Memoria document. It, it, it's all about the time and the process that it takes to do that, and so it's their complicated efforts. Yeah, I think also there are what, as many standards as stars in the sky, right? So uh, usually, any kind of cooperation between standards bodies or individual standards is seen as a huge benefit because there's already so many individual competing ones. Um, certainly in the, say, the IIIF space, uh, it's built upon other existing standards. Uh, and so we go back to the original authors of those when we make suggestions or comments or changes. Uh, and it's seen as positive that we're using that work to build something else uh, entirely. Um, even, you know, pointing out that there's some flaw with the uh, Creative Commons uh, licensing model or something, you know, it, all that kind of thing all feeds back into each other. Um, yeah? 
I think uh, the recommendations of Memorov are uh, uh, um, compared to the standards you're talking about, very general. So what we try to do is to f find or uh, uh, identify the most important points of some standards or changements in stand standards, introduce them in the recommendations that are in uh, understandable language for for non-technical stuff. So I think this is one of the most important roles or functions of this kind of recommendation. So we try, of course, to point to the standards that are uh, important for, for the field, but I don't think that we are in any concurrence or something of that, that we are on a different level uh, with these kind of, of uh, recommendations. Okay. It's not the same target uh, group, I think. Okay, I guess we just have time for one last question. One right? more, if there is one. If there is one, I just have one. Just, All right. how do you measure your success or your failures? I didn't see that coming. Um, I, I, I would say, uh, if, if people, if there's chatter about it, and if people use it, and um, that's how we would measure success, and if there's failure, I hear about that, too. Um, <laughs> so, so you know. Yeah, so in IIIF, we need two independent implementations of it for it to stay within. And we don't consider time spent on something that didn't end up in there as a failure because it still contributed to something somehow. Um, but yeah, definitely use, getting use of the standard is the, the gold standard. I would like to, to measure the success in improvements of preservation measures and uh, improved access, of course, but this is very difficult. Um, so the second most direct way for us to measure success is improved grant applications that we receive. Okay, interesting. All right, um, thank you so much.